anniversary. So I am so I am really, really excited to be in this position, continue to be part of the bleeding disorders community. So just a quick over. Do I think most of you, you are on the line, Mathelia Federation. Okay, bleeding. Um, the next slide, please, Robin. We we talk about advocacy. Oh, before I start, I also want to just give you guys a heads up. I am calling from sort of set the theater. I am calling you, uh, calling in from sunny Minnesota, where it is a balmy 36 degrees, which is actually a very good thing because it means the snow of which we had about 15 inches a couple of weeks ago is now melting. The bad news about that is I happen to have this really quirky allergy, which is an allergy to the mold that grows under the snow. So I apologize for my a little bit of a scratchy throat, and I may every so often need to just put myself on mute to because um, I'll have a little bit of a cough or something. So I just want to let you know that. The other thing is because I work from home, I also am accompanied here um, in my office with my by my dog Gus, who likes to bark at things that go by the house. So you may hear a dog barking a little bit too. So anyway, back to the slides. Um, things to know about HFA, um, I think most of these you're familiar with. We provide programming throughout the year, educational tools that we have. Um, we go to Washington DC to advocate on behalf of bleeding disorders as well as work with you at the state level, which is what we're talking about today. Um, we have great resources through our newsletter and regular e-blast updates. And finally, we have a phenomenal um, professional staff dedicated to advocacy at HFA. So what is advocacy? Um, I, I won't go into a lot of detail of the first ones that you see on the list. It's actually, um, you know, Robin talked about those are going to be some of the the key areas you're going to spend or already have spent some time on webinars in the webinar series, really understanding where there are so many different opportunities to be an advocate for bleeding disorders, whether it's in school, in the emergency room, and making sure that the um, emergency room care providers understand what you need for care in an emergency room, whether it's with your physicians, um, or, and certainly, uh, we all can use a lot of help in advocating with our insurance plans, understanding how they work, and um, how to, as I always say, not take no for an answer. So, we are going to spend our ta time today talking about government advocacy. In particular, we're going to focus on state legislative advocacy, but I just want to make sure to highlight that there are a number of different parts of government that we can be advocates. Uh, certainly on the federal level, NHF just had their Washington days. It was an opportunity for community members to fly to Washington, D.C., to visit with their congressional delegation and to share their story about what it's like to live with a bleeding disorder and help build awareness there. We also advocate with the federal government, with the administration, whether it's the FDA or the Centers for Medicaid, Medicare Services. So there's the regulatory um, version of government that we on the federal level advocate for. And we do the same thing at the state level, at the state legislature. So in Sacramento with your assembly members and your senators, as well as with the governor's administration. So with the folks in the Department of Health and the Department of Children's Services, making sure I'm going to get all of the names of the departments right. It's been a little while since I've talked about policy in California and, um, and in the governor's office. <laughs> and then when it comes to dealing with regulation, you know, there's a number of people in, in throughout um, the state of California that we spend time helping to educate about why it's important that people with bleeding disorders have access to their medicine. Let's take a quick drink of water, you guys. So I think the most important thing to note here is that the work of advocacy is to have fun. And advocacy is and can be fun. So um, 
I, I like to think of these five points, and actually I should probably put them in a circle because you don't start with one and end with one. It really is a circle of ongoing work of advocacy. Um, that's what that's the key for education. That's when we go to Sacramento. We're going to meet with our legislators and their staff and talk about um, what it's like to live with a bleeding disorder and how some of the decisions they may make could impact our life so that they really understand that we're educating them, we're building awareness. Research is a critical component of advocacy. We want to make sure before we talk to our um, policymakers that we have the facts and that we have the facts right. That's why we put together backgrounders and talking points. That's why we have key opinion leaders, some of whom I'm sure are on this call, who we call on who understand bleeding disorders and the science of caring for people with bleeding disorders so they can share that information with, the, um, with our policymakers. The most, for me, one of the most important parts of advocacy is telling your story. Advocacy is all about building relationships. When you have established a relationship, it's so much easier to go in and make your case with a policymaker. The best way to start a relationship with someone is to make a meaningful, um, have that meaningful, memorable, and impactful story that they can connect with, that they don't forget. And even if my story is different than your story, even if I don't have a bleeding disorder, but I hear what happens to you when you go in the emergency room and what that experience is like, it takes me back to the time that I had to go into the emergency room with my daughter. So there is a connection there. It's a relationship that we're starting to build. That's what we want to do with our elected and appointed officials so that year after year, they are aware of the needs of people with bleeding disorders. And then we have to be organized. We organizing means, you know, building that base of supporters. And in the bleeding disorders community, because it is a rare disease, uh, the numbers are smaller. And so we need to figure out how to broaden that base of support and have a lot of folks that we can call on to make sure that they're also there at the ready to reach out to their legislators and ask them to vote yes or no on certain issues. And finally, we have to have a plan so that we can mobilize everybody. And that, I, sorry, you guys, I'm gonna take another drink of water quick. And that's what we're doing now. I mean, we're, we're you know, working together so we understand our roles as advocates, and then we'll be going to, <clears throat> to Sacramento for Ledge Day, and the future leaders will be going for their training prior to Ledge Day, and, and it doesn't stop there. So how do we continue to mobilize? We'll talk a little bit more about that in today's slides. So uh, quickly, we're gonna talk about, you know, simply getting ready for your meeting, having your meeting, and following up. And that's what we're gonna talk about throughout um, the rest of the slides with um, focusing a little bit on one of the key issues that's come up in the governor's budget, which is what we'll be, um, we'll be advocating about uh, it on May 2nd um, in Sacramento. And as you notice on the bottom of this slide, relax, legislators are people too. It's really important sometimes even you know, even I know, and I've been doing this for a long time, not going to talk about how long, but most of my career has been about doing policy, advocacy, lobbying, um, and politics. And those first meetings you have with the legislator are always, you always have a little bit of anxiety. But then I always remember what my mom always told me, Kim, <clears throat> they are people too. They get up in the morning and they put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you do. And they run for office because there's an issue that they cared about, a problem they wanted to solve. That's no different than, than most people. And so when we go in to meet with them, really think of legislators as problem solvers. Most of them, that's why they're there. And that's a big part of our job as advocates to go in and ask them to help solve our problems. Next slide, please, Robin. So in our preparation, um, 
we're going to go through a little bit more detail of preparation. But I think as we get ready, just make sure before you meet with your legislator, whether it's um, going in to visit with them in Sacramento in their office, whether it's visiting with them in their district office, whether it's picking up the phone to call them. Even before you call your legislator, you may want to take a few minutes sit down, jot a few notes of what you want to talk about and what you want to ask them for so that you're prepared. So please always remember to take the time to prepare. And then think about as you're going into a meeting, for instance, when we go to Sacramento, we'll be going into these meetings not by ourselves, but with a group. So who has what role? Who in the meeting is a constituent of that legislator? Who's there to support them? And especially in the case of the way that the Hemophilia Council of California plans their ledge day is, as you guys all know, or those of you who are new are going to learn, the future leaders <coughs> really lead the meeting, excuse me, really are the leaders of the meeting, and the rest of us are in the room to support them. So see that in twofold support role. One, I'm a constituent, but I still may be a supporter of the future leader, and two, I'm a supporter like I would be because I'm coming from Minnesota. I'm not a constituent, so I'm there to support. So if a question get asked that gets asked that someone in the room may not know, perhaps I do and I can answer it. We'll talk a little bit about more about questions getting asked later in the presentation too. Okay, next slide. So in our preparation prior to the meeting, thinking about how you want to build that relationship with your legislator, if you have not yet spent time getting to know your legislator or about him or her, um, this website will take you, it will give you um, the information that you're looking for to learn more about your legislator. Through this lookup, you'll learn who your assembly member is and who your senator is. And with that, then you can, you know, Use whatever uh, web engine you use for research. I use Google, so I would Google their name. They probably have their own website, a Facebook page. I'm sure you can you know, Google the news about them and learn more about them. And by doing that, you might learn where they went to college, what some of their interests are, how many children they have. Sometimes they talk about how old their children are. Something in, in that you can find that you relate to. So when you go into your meeting and you introduce yourself, one of the first things you're able to do is share that connection. Hi, my name is Kim Eisenberg. I'm a constituent. I happen to live three blocks away from you and I think our children go to school together. That might be a great way to start your meeting. And then the next thing you wanna think about is that what we call the elevator speech. Just a few things describing your bleeding disorder and the issue you wanna talk about so that you can kind of set the stage. So, um, so, so think about what you might say in that case. Uh, and maybe, maybe it's, you know, when you think about a bleeding disorder, you might wanna say, you know, I'm here with the Hemophilia Council of California. We're here today to talk about bleeding disorders. I have hemophilia, not sure you're familiar with hemophilia, but it means that there's a protein that's missing, that I'm missing, that my body doesn't clot. And that might be all you need to get started to go into the rest of the meeting. And then start thinking about what, with the issue that you're there to talk about that day, how your bleeding disorder um, is not only affecting your life, but the impact that issue might have on your life. We'll talk a little bit more about that in future slides as well. So then, um, if you could go back, I'm sorry, um, Robin, I had to take a minute for a little <clears throat> break. Um, so then, you know, again, again, personalizing it, talking about those issues that really matter the most to you, access to your medicine, access to your providers, in how fabulous your hemophilia treatment center is, how fabulous your specialty pharmacy is. Those are the things you want to think about, about what you want to share. Um, and today we're actually going to talk about an issue about hemophilia treatment centers and the comprehensive care that they provide. That will be one of the issues we'll be discussing in Sacramento, and I'll focus on that um, today yet. Okay, now next slide, please, Robin. Okay, so. 
we will go back to the more detail level of what we're going to talk about in the meeting and now we'll just talk about again the 40,000 foot level of what happens during your meeting. First of all, when you get, and any of you who've been there you, to Sacramento, to the Capitol, know this, you have to be flexible. There may be a lot of time spent standing in a hallway. You may even have your meeting in the hallway or your legislator gets called to a vote or gets called into the chairperson's office. So that you may have to rearrange things. You may have to walk with them and talk. You may have to meet them in the cafeteria as opposed to in their office. Just, you know, be flexible. Use the time you have with them, even if you're walking from one room to the other. Make sure you're using that time to tell your story, to get to your point, so that you're using um, your time best for you, but also for your legislator. Also, be on time. That I, that's one area where I don't have a lot of flexibility. I think it's really important for us who have asked for the meeting with the legislator to be on time. Um, they may not be able to be on time either because they're running late from a committee hearing or, as I mentioned, they get called to something else um, or called into the governor's office or something like that. So, so we, that's the part of flexibility that we really need to be. If you can't be on time, make sure you call ahead. If you're running behind and it happens, make sure you call ahead and let the staff know that you're running late so that they, <clears throat> so that they know. Um, Okay, so the first thing you do when you open that door is you introduce yourself to the person who's um, behind the desk or who might be um, in the entryway of the, of the office, and there will be continual introductions of yourself throughout that 15 to 20 minute meeting. Um, please know that there are often times that you meet with the staffer as opposed to the legislator. And as a former staffer, I'm here to tell you, they're great. They, um, the thing about legislators is particularly in California, you have term limits and a lot of the staff have been around a lot longer. And so we, if we can connect with staff who will be there year after year after year, they will have that wonderful awareness about bleeding disorders and be able to help advise the legislator uh, when it comes time for him or her to vote on an issue that would impact uh, the community. So, um, so think of, of the of meeting with the staff is actually a great opportunity to continue um, to be a good advocate. And then, pardon me, if you, after you introduce yourself, like we talked about, so walk in the door, um, preferably put your hand out to shake and say, hi, I'm Kim Eisenberg. I'm here with the Hemophilia Council of California. We have a meeting with Assembly Member Smith at two o'clock. Um, and here's the rest of our group and people come in and then you'll get set up to have your meeting. So then you will discuss the issues, which we're gonna talk about in a couple of slides from now. Leave behind the information. So please, it's the leave behind. So when you're leaving, that's when you give them the packet of information. Why is this important? One, we wanna make sure they have the facts and they have the information. So as, as um, issues come and go throughout the day, um, throughout the months, they can go back and look at this information, but also leave behind because you don't wanna give it to them when you get started talking. Because then what you find happens is they start looking through your packet and they might be missing particularly the most important thing, which is your personal story, which you're sharing. And before you leave, make sure you ask for a photo. And we'll talk a little bit about follow-up and how important those photos are in the next slides ahead as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, so during the meeting, this is, the, this is one of the issues that this year um, will be discussed during uh, ledge days on May 2nd. So just a little bit of background. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about um, the issue. There will be further training as we get closer to May 2nd, but just a high level to understand why this issue is important. The governor has proposed in his uh, 2000, and I think it's called the 2019 budget, correct me if I'm wrong, Robin, um, that the, that um, <laughs> that um, 
to to basically eliminate or limit the use of 340B federal drug pricing program reimbursements within Medi-Cal. And what does this mean is that um, it's not singling out hemophilia treatment centers, but because hemophilia treatment centers are a qualified entity, sometimes referred to as a grantee of the 340B program, um, they have the ability to get discounts um, on the drugs that they purchase and then that revenue that they are able to have, um, that additional revenue based upon those discounts helps to support your hemophilia treatment comprehensive care program. So for instance, when you go into your hemophilia treatment center for your annual, um, your annual physical and your annual clinic, then the, the additional care that you might get when you see your social worker and when you see the physical therapist, all of that meeting is reimbursed under one, um, one reimbursement. And so the, that, that additional service that you're getting, uh, it's that additional revenue that comes from uh, the discount that helps to pay for that. That was a little probably more, more detail than I even actually wanted to give. But you can see why the, there is concern because if, if that, uh, that 340B program and those discounts are eliminated, that beca can become problematic for the HTCs to provide that comprehensive care. And that is the key message um, for the Sacramento days and this issue and why Hemophilia Council of California opposes um, th this governor's budget proposal because you wanna go in and say, you don't have to go into the detail about how um, that pricing program works. Let, let the Medi-Cal folks help the legislators understand that. What our job is when we go in to visit with our legislators is to help them understand that it is that comprehensive care program that comes through the hemophilia treatment center that has done so much for the bleeding disorders community. Um, you can talk about, so, so perhaps you have a story that you could share with your legislator about the time that you had to have your wisdom teeth removed and your dentist didn't have any experience with a bleeding disorder so your dentist is able to reach out to your hemophilia treatment center and they are able to help provide the advice and counsel to your dentist to make sure you get the treatment you need when you have your wisdom teeth removed. And you know, you, you could, if that's been your experience, that may be a story that you want to share. Um, I think next slide, please. So I guess I kind of hit that in what I just said. So how, how the hemophilia treatment center has impacted your life. It meant you got to go have your wisdom teeth out without having to miss weeks upon weeks of school because, um, because you, you were able to make sure you got the right amount of your clotting factor before you had your, before you had your wisdom teeth out. So you only missed the normal amount of school as opposed to um, what might have happened um, had you not had your hemophilia treatment center help you through that process and help your dentist through that process. And then finally, after you've told that story, after the folks who are in the room with you are helping to support the importance of comprehensive care and the importance of the hemophilia treatment center to um, the quality of the, the increased quality of care for people with bleeding disorders, it comes to your ask, and your ask is what hema, with the, the Hemophilia Council of California has provided to you, and that's to ask the legislator to oppose that portion of the governor's budget. And if I have that wrong, you can let me know, Robin, but I think, I think that that's what I would call the ask in the meeting that you have. Next slide, please. So during the meeting, I think it's really important to remember that um, no matter what we do in life, we have our own jargon. And in the bleeding disorders community, the, you know, we use the term profi and prophylaxis. Even, even our elected officials may not understand what prophylaxis is. So if we wanna talk about our profi, if we wanna talk about explaining how you infuse your clotting factor every third day 
um, and that's prophylactic, that you might want to be able to explain that to them so they understand how you ensure that you are able to be um, able to go to school, able to go to work, live a, a, what um, most folks would think of as a, as um, a normal life. Um, and then think about acronyms. We, we're going to be talking about the hemophilia treatment centers in the meeting. So it, and, and most of the time we say HTC, but throughout your, your conversation with your legislator, you might want to say HTC, throw in hemophilia treatment center. When you say HTC, maybe the next time it's hemophilia treatment center. Just help them understand um, because they don't know those acronyms. And any complex terms, if you can simplify them, it, it's always really helpful. Words that really work in the Capitol and with elected and appointed officials are words like access. Words that explain what hemophilia or von Willebrand's brands or other rare bleeding disorders are. They're rare and they're chronic. They don't go away. You're born with them, you live with them. Um, prevention. A prophylactic treatment is a prevention, so you might want to explain that. And quality and affordable care. They really want to emphasize the importance of the quality of care that we have achieved now in 2018 and that it's critically important that we keep that quality of care and that it's affordable for every member of the community. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and before you leave, make sure that you offer to be a resource to your legislator. You, after all, are the expert on bleeding disorders. You are the expert about why it's important to have access to your care. You are the expert on what happens when there is a bleed and how it should be treated. So um, make sure to offer to be a resource, which means making to, sure to leave your contact information with your legislative office, with, your, with the staff or with the legislator. Um, during the meeting, if there's any questions that are asked that you don't know the answer to, simply say that you don't know the answer, but that you will find it out and you will get back to them. And actually, that's a great opportunity and another chance to um, continue to build your relationship with your policymakers and elected officials. So make sure you jot down what the question is, bring it back to um, Robin or or your chapter, and then and then we will make sure that, that there's follow-up with that legislator so they get the answer that he or she is looking for. Make sure you take their business card or business cards from the offices before you leave. In Sacramento, as many of you know, they're right there on the desk when you enter the office because then you'll be able to have their contact info. You'll be able to use that info to continue to follow up with them and perhaps even utilize in social media. And then most of all, don't forget to say thank you. And I always say, after you do your ask and your legislator acknowledges that it's an important ask, but right now, you know, they're not sure if they're going to support you or actually they've already decided they're voting for the governor's budget. We still need to say thank you. We need to thank them for their time. They actually have a quite a thankless job. Um, they spend their days with revolving doors of people like us coming in and talking with them about key issues that matter to us. Um, so it's really important that we say thank you. All right, next slide. And that's, you know, after the meeting, send a thank you note. And every state is a little bit different. I think if you're a really busy person and you don't know when you're going to get around to writing that thank you, you know, you should send an email. Um, but Terry um, tells us that, that in Sacramento, they still like getting handwritten thank you. So I think it's a great idea if you can do that. And then you took a picture. So you took a picture with your legislator. And so um, that, that picture can then be tweeted. It can go on your Facebook page. You can send that picture to your legislator for him or her to use in their own Facebook page or their other sources of social media. It's just one more way to get the information out about the Hemophilia Council of California, about bleeding disorders, um, and, and, uh, and it, it, legislators like having their name out there and they're used to having their pictures taken. So, 
So they will appreciate um, that opportunity. Next slide, please. And then you can stay informed by following um, the Hemophilia Federation website. We have a lot of information about you know, key issues that are trending throughout the US and policy positions on those issues. We like to keep you all up to date on what's going on on both the federal and, um, and on some of the state issues. I think the other thing is, is that um, you can keep informed also, and I don't have the resources on here, but certainly through the Hemophilia Council of California, they'll be able to keep you informed about what's going on in California. And you can even go into um, the California website and get an RSS feed on some of the bills that, you, that, um, that are important to you, as well as the ones that the Hemophilia Council of California is tracking. Okay, I think um, we can open for questions. So I'm <clears throat> Uh, your five second warning, everyone. I'm going to unmute everyone. So if you want to ask a question directly, you'll be able to. There we go. So everyone should be um, off of mute who is automatically muted on my end. If you are calling in on your phone and you muted yourself, you'll need to take yourself off of mute. So, Kim, I'll get us started. I had a question for you. And now, of course, this. I uh, used a great concrete example of the issue. One of the issues we'll be um, addressing on our legislative day, and of course, the skills that you outlined in the process applies to any issue that someone wants to um, speak with their legislator about. But if someone were to visit a local office, is there anything that would be different in this process or this procedure? Well, if you're visiting, thanks for the question. If you're visiting a local office, um, I would, I think there's a couple of things to find out. So the process of setting up your meeting is going to be the same. You really want to try to set up a meeting with your local office when your legislator is going to be in town. Um, you actually will get, you may get better attention from your legislator if that's the case because they aren't gonna be distracted by the governor's office calling them into a meeting or by a committee hearing that they have to run to, or you know that they're running late in that day and they have three more appointments after yours. Um, you probably will get a little bit more focus from your legislator in their district office. I'm not as familiar, and maybe someone else on the phone could even jump in to answer this. It, it's, it's, sometimes it depends um, in, in some states there's enough staff that you know cover different issues so there might be a healthcare liaison in the district office if there's not it's probably there they probably don't have a lot of staff in their district office and they would just get a general overview and i would use the time to make sure that they know that you're local you're close by you would be more than happy to um you know to even attend town hall meetings to attend a panel that the legislator might be sponsoring so that you could talk about, you know, making sure to have access for medicines for people with rare disease like bleeding disorders. Those are some of the things you can do, excuse me, when you, when you go to their um, in district office. And then um, for other ways, like for example, if someone isn't able to travel to the Capitol or is shy about going into their local representative's office on an issue, um, what are some of the other good, good ways that really have an impact of communicating with your legislator on an issue? Yeah, um, so I, I probably, should have been on this in the slides and so thanks for asking the question Robin there's a number of ways where you can um, have the opportunity to educate your elected officials and their staff most elected officials so once you find out if they have a Facebook page a website typically you can get on their mailing list so that you will know if they have town hall meetings coffees 
you can show up at those meetings that generally, um, depending upon the legislator, they have on a regular basis. So say they have it every second Saturday of the month. They have a coffee in the district. Maybe this month you can't make it, but you can make it next month. So make sure you get that on your calendar. You take the opportunity to go in and visit them there or attend a town hall meeting. And in a town hall meeting, if there's a lot of other people in the room, they're going to be able to um, hear about, you know, that you're going to help build awareness with a broader audience if you get up and ask questions or share some of your personal story in a town hall meeting. You then can also write or call any time your legislator. Um, in fact, I encourage you to do so because you can't always get to Sacramento and everybody has busy lives. And if you want to build a relationship with someone, you know, you have to communicate with them. So, you know, send a note every once in a while. And particularly send a note when they've done something that you really appreciate they've done. And just send a quick note and say, Thank you, Assemblymember Smith. I saw yesterday that you, and it might not be an issue having to do with bleeding disorders. They might say, I saw yesterday that you um, voted for the funding for the schools, something or other, you know, send them a note and let them know you're watching and you appreciate, you know, what they've done. Those things are important to do. Another thing that you can do to help build awareness um, about about bleeding disorders and about the need for access to care are looking to other um, community organizations. The Rotary always is looking for speakers. So maybe if you are a person who is inclined to, to speak publicly, you might get to go in front of the Rotary and you might ask to be on their speaker circuit and then you can get up and tell your story. Um, and, and legislators typically attend Rotaries or some of their staff. So that's another way to get to them. Um, your lo your local Lions Club, but just w whichever community organizations there are in your community, if you're actively participating in them, they're usually, because they're a civic-minded organization, they typically have the ear of your legislator. So helping them better understand, um, the, you know, the comprehensive care of a hemophilia treatment center or what it means to live with a bleeding disorder or how your care today is different than it was 40 years ago are things you know that you can think about sharing. I could do no problem. I could do Monday at 11. Okay. All right. All right, do we have any questions from the group? Any last questions for Kim? All right, thank you very much, Kim, for your time today and leading us through the step-by-step -step approach to um, meeting with legislators as an individual. I'd like to remind everyone that this webinar is part of a series that happens every other month. So you can find upcoming webinars as well as recordings of past webinars at hemophiliaca.org and under our um, webinars tab. And thank you again to our 2018 webinar series sponsors, Shire and BioVerative. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, everyone. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. See you soon.